Hey everybody, this is Praxis. River and I are enjoying one of the first days of spring here in New England. The winters always feel, I think, a little bit too long, although that's probably the way people feel over much of the world that winters always feel a little too long. Great to be having spring coming back. River's trying to hunt up some red spotted newts in the stream here. But today's video has nothing to do with outdoors or wilderness skills, bushcraft, or any of that stuff. Today's video is much more indoors, much, much more bookish. And it's been requested by a lot of you guys that I talk about libraries, specifically prepper libraries, and what you know, what we're doing here at our homestead in relation to, you know, keeping books for an emergency and just in general. Uh, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I have a pretty extensive library. In fact, the new homestead that we built has an entire room, which we call the library for good reason. I'm showing you an image of it right now. It's a library. We have, uh, you know, we've accumulated so many books over time that it, it is, uh, you know, it's a great resource for us, both for entertainment and for information and for emergency skills. So we're going to be talking about some of the books that we keep in our library. Now, obviously, not all, not all of them. Uh, but we're going to go into some of the books that I think are more important, maybe some of the books that I feel are less important. And I think some of the books that we keep in our library might surprise you. So stick around and let's get right to it. Okay, so why is it important to have a paper library? Well, if you're a prepper, one of the primary reasons is that you have this sense, this crazy notion, that maybe some of the things that we have access to today, like internet or whatever, might not always be available to us, either temporarily or permanently or whatever. Having a paper library physically within your home is a great way to have access to information and enrichment and entertainment, even if some of those other things get taken away. One uh, situation that I saw come up over and over during the COVID situation was that people were going nuts. They just didn't know how to entertain themselves without a lot of things that they were used to having access to. Now, many people still had access to the internet and electronic media and everything, but you know, not being able to go out, not being able to socialize, it really drove them crazy. Uh, so if you were in a similar situation where Maybe the thing that gets lost is access to electronic communication or the internet or any of that. Having some sort of uh, something to fall back on, I think, is really important. You know, both for informational reasons, for research, and also just for pure entertainment. You know, I think a lot of people think that if a prepper had a library, it's probably just like a hundred different books on how to like debone a worm or untie a rifle or, you know, things like that that are, you know, more hardcore kind of... Uh, you know, bushcraft skills, all that kind of stuff. Well, I think it's important to have all sorts of different things. The section behind me here is my uh, mostly fiction stuff. Uh, there's fiction, there's some educational materials over there that are in terms of science. You know, here uh, is a little sampling of books that I have over there. I have field guides, this is a, a mammal field guides, different North American mammals. That's over there. We have a whole section of encyclopedias back there. There's a lot of different things back there, and it's it's a rich mix. Uh, it's not just the types of things you would think would be in a prepper's library. What I'd like to do is talk about some of the general books that I have generally in the library, and then I want to go to a couple different sections that, yes, do have some specific application for people who are into prepping and preparedness. Uh, like I said, behind me is a lot of uh, fiction. Uh, types of things. And, uh, you know, here's an example. This is something that I'm uh, reading with my boy right now, The Martian. You know, ha having something like this, you know, I guess it's applicable if you ever got uh, marooned on Mars. You can maybe learn some lessons from this, although I have heard some scientific critical uh, critiques of this book that maybe there are some scientific inaccuracies in here. But the primary reason for having this is entertainment. And like I said, that's an important thing if you're in a situation where you kind of lose access to some of those things that you're used to, having some way of passing time and not going stir crazy is really important. Here's another book that's over in that, actually this is maybe, this should maybe be in the current events section or the nonfiction section. I'm joking, this is George Orwell's 1984. You know, I have a lot of classic books back there. And, you know, it's important just to have a broad mix of things. This is one thing that my boy likes a lot. This is, uh, it's kind of a historical but um, entertaining book at the same time. It's a look at a, a street through time and it kind of starts with, uh, you know, this uh, primitive sort of uh, landscape next to a river, and it talks about it at different time, uh, time periods, you know, uh, uh, in human development, anyway. You know, uh, big picture books like this can be fun if you have kids, uh, you know, things that are enter uh, entertaining and educational. I do homeschooling here, so we have a lot of books that uh, are useful for that, where when we're learning about, uh, you know, 
a certain time period in history, I might be able to pull a book right off of the shelf here and it'll have some usefulness. Other sections that we have here are things about travel. Uh, and travel can include things like uh, far away travel. For us, Costa Rica is a far away place. And it's nice to be able to kind of think about your future. I know a lot of times people think that preppers don't think that we have a future, that it's, it's all doom and gloom. I would like to go, I've been to Costa Rica once before. I'd like to go back there again. And having things like this is a great way of kind of passing the time and daydreaming about the possible futures that we could have in our world if we don't destroy it first. Uh, also things that are interesting to have in kind of a travel section are maps. Uh, I've started uh, carrying maps, paper maps, around with me in my car. Uh, with the situation going on with Ukraine and the possibility of hacking or the GPS system being kind of uh, downgraded intentionally by the United States or, or hacked into or whatever or destroyed, you know, who, who knows what. Having paper maps can be a great way of getting yourself out of a bind. I think a lot of people are really addicted uh, and completely reliant upon the GPS system. So having paper maps is a good way of, you know, just having that insurance if you're driving around, if your GPS stops working for whatever reason. I mean, GPS just have technical issues. I think it's always great to have that kind of paper backup. So I've talked generally about a lot of the things that we have here in the library. Now let's talk about a couple of very specific sections that I think are really applicable specifically to preppers. The first section that I want to talk about is my gardening section. This whole shelf right here is all about plants and gardening. I'm going to go through some of the books here that I think are some of the more important ones that I have up here. This one right here is on root cellaring. This is something that you can do with the produce from your garden. I have a new root cellar that I've been experimenting with here at the new homestead. I've learned a lot from this book about various ways of storing things in a root cellar. It's not as simple as just building a root cellar and then just throwing things in there. Uh, different types of plants uh, and crops like different sorts of environments. Some like to be drier, some like to be uh, maybe more moist, some like to be buried in something like sawdust or like sand. So I've been learning a lot about root cellaring from a root cellaring book. A lot of this stuff, uh, you know, it's, it's not necessarily obvious. So uh, it's great to get the experience of someone that's already gone through it by, you know, reading their experiences out of a book. General gardening book here. Uh, this is a Crockett's Victory Garden. I have one on organic gardening. Uh, this is a book just about uh, pests and how to do pest management. Um, I mix in some kids books in here. Garden Works is just the gardening section. More about vegetable gardening. Uh, this is a, a, you know, this is a guide that is cool in that it has a lot of uh, time scales about how long a seed takes to go, get from, uh, you know, planting to germination to actually uh, giving you fruit in the end. So, so this is a, a nice guide that has a lot of charts that are, you know, easy to look up how long something's going to take to grow. Uh, interesting book called Square Foot Gardening, uh, which is a little bit militarized for my uh, my taste, but what I like about it is that it really lays out uh, the amount of space that different garden crops take up. So uh, you know, if you're a first-time gardener, sometimes you may take uh, different seeds that maybe need a little bit more room and you may plant them too close, uh, too close to each other. This uh, book gives you a handy way of looking up how much space each plant's going to require. This is another Victory Garden book here. This is for indoor gardening. This is for just... Uh, uh, Different house plants, not really a garden book, but it's about how to grow things indoors. Uh, this is a very interesting book. It's called Seed to Seed, and it is about how to take a seed, plant it, uh, have the plant go through its life cycle, and then collect the seeds from that plant in a way such that you can grow it again. There are lots of things that you can do to screw that process up. One of the more... Um, one of the ones that I think a lot of people make the, the mistake of, and I know I made this mistake when I started gardening, is that... If you plant different squash next to each other, say like a butternut squash and a pumpkin uh, next to each other in the garden, they may grow very well. They like uh, similar sorts of environments for uh, growing and uh, developing fruit and giving you that fruit. But if you plant them next to each other in the garden, there's a really good chance that bees are going to go and pollinate the pumpkins and then they're going to fly right over to the butternut squash and the pollen's going to get uh, jumped back and forth between those two plants and the seeds that either one of those plants ends up giving you at the end of the season uh, are probably not going to be pure pumpkin seeds or pure butternut squash seeds they are going to be some kind of a weird hybrid and you may get lucky and that hybrid may be wonderful or more likely than not the hybrid is going to be something that's kind of like oh this is not that great it's some kind of a squash but uh you know it's not what i was expecting and you know it may not yield as much as a butternut or a pumpkin and you know there's a lot of things you can screw up. Now, there are techniques you can use for growing uh, squash near each other, and they're outlined in a book like this. Uh, another book I have here is The Worm Book. It's about composting. Uh, I 
I feel like that one's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, well, at least from my perspective, the way that I usually do composting is I take uh, you know food scraps and rotting stuff from you know uh, left over from the kitchen. I bring it outside and I put it on the ground. And that's the end of my composting process. I know a lot of people get really up into uh, different ways of composting and you should only put this in and uh, like if there's too much uh, oil on something, you shouldn't put it in. My, my composting process is very easy. Just take trash from the kitchen that's, you know, food and put it on the ground and nature does the rest. This book is kind of about that, about how the worms get up and they do their kind of thing. Uh, this is a really cool book, Botany in a Day. This is uh, not specifically gardening. I have it in the garden section because it's about plants and how to utilize them. Uh, this is a book written by a friend of mine, Thomas Elpel, uh, whom I met because he writes some awesome books and I wanted to meet, meet him and we've become friends since. But this is a great book on wild uh, edible plant identification. If you want the entire forest around you to be your garden. This is a really cool book to have. This is a, a version of it for kids, and this is another book on wild edible plants. One of my favorite uh, publications of a wild edible plant book is this one by Thomas Elias and Peter A. Dykeman. Probably, it's the one I bring, I've got an older copy of this that I put in my bug out bag, my EDC bag actually, that I bring with me all the time. So gardening section is a great thing to have because there's no way for me anyway to have all that information up in my head right now, especially when I'm in a time in my life where I'm not using it all the time. I'm, I've been practicing with gardening and I have been doing that over many years, but I've never had to depend my life on gardening. But if I were, if I was ever in a situation where I did need to, I would love to have this extra information that's in these books. The next section that I want to talk about is my medical book section. And it has a variety of different types of medical books here, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about what I have here on the shelf. Over on this side is some of the more naturalistic sort of uh, approaches to healing. If you didn't have access to Western medicine and you wanted to have some way of dealing with diarrhea or you know, a cut or anything. Sometimes working with the, what you have in the natural environment is the only option that you have to you. Sometimes it's the best option, even if you do have access to other things. And I have a lot of books on that type of thing here. There's a few books here I wanted to talk about in particular, uh, Where There Is No Doctor, Where There Is No Dentist, and the Survival Medical Handbook. Uh, these three books here together, I think, are really useful, and I've, I've popped into them from time to time for different things. Uh, they, they talk about exactly what the title suggests, like how to deal with medical situations when you don't have a doctor around, and it's just, you know, you have to do the best you can with the tools you have and the knowledge you have available to you. I would highly recommend getting some type of book that is like that, is that is tailored to the idea of not having access to... Uh, medical facilities, med medical infrastructure, or someone who's trained because, well, it's great to have the access to all that, but, you know, if you're in a situation where you don't have it, it's good to have something better to do than absolutely nothing. So having a book like that, I think, would be highly recommended, you know, just in case you're in a situation when that's the only option that you have. Uh, other books that we have here are uh, general first aid books, all three books here. This is specifically for children, uh, not aimed for children reading it, but for, you know, taking care of a child. These are some other first aid books here. This book here is a medical dictionary, and I think having a medical dictionary is an important thing to have in your library because as you're reading through other books, you may come to a word that you just don't know what the hell it means. I, there's a lot of uh, terminology in science and medicine that, uh, you know, are not necessarily obvious to everyone what they're actually talking about. So having a medical dictionary so you can kind of look things up and understand what that word is being used for and what it refers to, I think is really important to get the most out of all the other books. Uh, a, couple, a couple of other books that I have here that are uh, pretty useful. These, uh, the Pill Book and the Nursing Drug Handbook. Uh, this is a 2019 edition. Uh, these uh, are kind of compendiums of what different um, uh, drugs are available and what uh, some of their uses are, what some of their side effects are, and, uh, you know, just general information. If you have a... A pharmaceutical product, you know, what you can do with it, what you should be aware of with it, and what are some uh, different options for treating different sorts of situations. So these books together, I think, uh, create kind of a, a, a nice base so that if you're ever in a situation where, you know, you don't have access to the, you know, the hospital or that medical professional, you can at least take a pretty good stab yourself at what you are trying to fix. And in my own personal experience, I have better I have better luck just dealing with medical issues myself than I have going to medical professionals. Maybe that's just because I have really bad luck with professionals in general. It seems like, you know, when I, whenever I hire anyone for anything, I'm like, my God, I could have done that better than that person. And maybe it's just my bad luck that I get that with doctors a lot too. I'm sure there are many, 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 many highly qualified doctors out there. I just don't tend to be lucky enough to ever find them. So these books have always served me well.
The next two sections that I want to talk about are this one here and the one above it. Uh, first, this one here is just general interest types of things. There are books about ham radio, there's a book about bartending, there's Tai Chi Chuan, uh, how to make a, your own Zen rock garden, there are magic books, there are a lot of drawing books, how to you know, draw different things for kids, there's drawing uh, uh, anime characters. Uh, painting with watercolors, there's all sorts of different interesting uh, topics. And I think this is one of those sections where if you ever find that you have a lot of time on your hands and you can't engage with the world in the way that you are accustomed to for entertainment and fulfillment, having a section like this where you can just pop in and learn some kind of a skill that you'd never knew that you even had interest in, I think is a great opportunity. And I, I also like with my boy, if he shows a interest in something, I love the feeling of knowing that I have a book on the shelf ready to go, I can pop it off. And, and he can just get right to work being interested and curious about you know whatever he might be interested in that day. The section above it, uh, this is a interest of a specific type and this is all creating structures. Uh, if you guys have been watching my channel for a while, you know that I'm, uh, I've always been interested in creating your own structures. I've built four of my own houses, two mini houses, two full-size houses. One of them is the one that we're in right now. And this entire section is all about that kind of stuff. In fact, this book right here, it's called The Passive Solar House. Uh, having read this book, uh, this is about uh, how to create a, uh, a kind of a a thermal mass underneath your house to stabilize the temperatures within your house. And when we built the place that we're at right now, if you guys remember watching the uh, uh, Project Homestead series where I was building this place, one of the key elements was that on the floor of the bottom floor, before we put the, the concrete down, we put all these tunnels under the floor made out of uh, concrete blocks, uh, cinder blocks, put on their side. And this is the book where I learned that idea from, where I, I kind of modified from what they did here for what uh, to what we did. but having access to uh, you know just different people's thinking on this type of stuff empowers you to kind of uh, you know do a lot of your own stuff there are electrical books there's plumbing books in here I uh, like I mentioned a lot of architecture books you know and if you were ever in a situation where you wanted to build something like a shed having a section like this I think is really handy and even if you wanted to do any uh, you know, modifications on the home that you're you're in presently having a, a book about how to do electrical work I think that's a really important section to have now we've got one more section that I want to talk about and it's the one that is probably most applicable to, uh, to preppers It's my prepping and preparedness section and it's right over here so let's finish up with that section in my prepping and preparedness section I've got all the information that you would expect to find in a preppers library from how to clear the chamber on a chicken to how to avoid plarping a marauders bees there are a lot of books on so many different topics in here, and I'm going to go through this a little bit more uh, with a little bit more detail than I have some of the other ones because, I mean, this is a prepping channel and you're watching a, a prepping video on a prepping channel, a prepping library. Let's spend a little bit more time in this one. I've got the SAS Survival Handbook, which is just kind of general things about, you know, wilderness bushcraft kind of skills. If you were thrown out on a desert island somewhere, this would be skills that would be helpful to you in that situation, or if you were in some kind of uh, post-apocalyptic wasteland where you could be taking advantage of you know the remains of the past this is the, the kind of book for you uh, situational survival guide this is kind of a fun book uh, I, I don't recall exactly where I came across this one uh, but uh, it, it's a basic survival guide for all different types of things from tornadoes to cybersecurity wildfires all that kind of stuff uh, two books that I have uh, you know been into uh, recently. One is the uh, U.S. Armed Forces Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Survival Manual. Uh, this is a lot of information. Specifically, at the moment, we're uh, you know unfortunately all thinking about the nuclear aspect to that. Between this book and this book right here, which is also red, I guess red is the color for that, Nuclear War Survival Skills. They're helpful uh, books to help understand uh, what. Uh, what parts of nuclear war are more horrifying than you could possibly imagine and which parts maybe aren't actually as bad as you were expecting. So those two books right there I think uh, have both uh, terrified me and uh, set me at ease at the same time. Uh, this book here is a, a book that I've, I've mentioned several times on my channel. It's called The Strategic Relocation. Uh, you know, it's just called Strategic Relocation. It's written by uh, Joel M. Scusen, if I'm pronouncing his name pr uh, properly there. And this is a cool book. If you are living in an area where you don't feel as though, you know, if the shit hit the fan and you're there, 
you, if you figure like you're in a bad place for that to happen, you might be thinking about a new place to go. Now you could just randomly go to like a new place and hope that it's better than where you are, were at. But if you put a little research into it, you can actually land yourself in a much better situation. And that's what this book is specifically about. It goes uh, into great detail, uh, different regions of the United States, around the world, uh, the pros and cons of moving to different places. And in particular, they have a really cool set of maps for the United States anyway, I think in Canada also, uh, that uh, show the, all the different states and uh, they show, unfortunately, and again, this is something that we're dealing with uh, presently, they show uh, likely nuclear first and second strike targets in all the different states. You know, things that you might want to be aware of if you were going to move to, say, uh, Connecticut, <laughs> can't imagine why anyone would want to do that, but if you were going to move to Connecticut, you might want to not move downwind of New London, Connecticut, because there is a uh, nuclear power plant there. Um, and they, what, what is in, uh, you know, okay, the New London submarine base is uh, right, right near New, New London, and then the Millstone nuclear power plant is just uh, south of there on the water. If you were going to move to this area, you know, you might want to be more over in this area versus in this area. In New England, the prevailing winds go from the northwest down to uh, the southeast. At least that's the way it normally is when we have a, uh, you know, a hurricane or something like that. The winds are, you know, coming from any which direction. Uh, but uh, knowing where some of these targets are, uh, or, uh, you know, just a nuclear power plant, they can have issues. In fact, uh, this particular nuclear power plant, the Millstone nuclear power plant, um, I, I remember reading the paper not too long ago that they were having an issue uh, with the changing climate and summers being hotter than they were in the past. The water coming down the river, I know this is really controversial stuff, uh, the water coming down the river was hotter than it had ever been before, and it exceeded what had been on the books in terms of what is a safe temperature for the water to be going into that nuclear power plant for it to still be cool enough to cool down the rods. Uh, and they had an interesting solution to the problem is that they just changed it. They, they erased in their books what the safe limit was and they made it higher. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, if you were thinking about moving to a new place, knowing where some of the, oh my God, I don't where that's in Wyoming. There are a lot of missile, si uh, missile sites in uh, Wyoming and Nebraska up over here. You know, you might want to not move into the middle of a place like that. So anyway, it's a pretty, it's a really cool book. If you're thinking about moving, this would be a good book to kind of jump on uh, to uh, give yourself a sense of, uh, you know, where you might want to move to or where you might not want to move to. This one's more a joke than anything else. I just found this at a thrift store. The worst case scenario survival handbook. I mean, it has some actual, st oh my God, it has an awful image of uh, if someone's choking, uh, how to perform a tracheotomy. Sometimes the uh, cure is worse than the disease on that one. So, uh, you know, that's a little bit of a joke, but I mean, where the heck else am I gonna put that book? Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, uh, psychology operations of guerrilla wars. Unfortunately, that's becoming more of a thing. Um, uh, you know, some of the stuff is general hiking as well. There's uh, hunting stuff, fishing stuff, uh, trailblazing types of things, um, uh, archery, ice fishing, uh, fly fishing, uh, this is a cool book. I got this recently. This is about knots. Uh, knots are a really... There's only so many simple knots you can pile on top of each other to do an effective job sometimes. Sometimes you actually need to know the, the correct knot to do a certain job. And this has been a really great book for me. In fact, uh, is it this one here? No, it's not that one there. I learned a really cool knot called the, the sheep bend knot when I was uh, doing research for the, actually for the Alien Invasion series. Uh, a sheep bend knot, which is now one of my favorite knots for tying two pieces of rope together. It's so much easier and more effective and easier to uh, release afterwards than just doing my idiot kind of simple knot over on top of simple knot until I feel like I got enough of them. Having a knot book, I think, is a really cool thing to have. Uh, I'm going to try to put some links down in the description below to some of these things that I, I've got on here. It won't be exhaustive, but, uh, you know, if you want to kind of jumpstart yourself on, uh, you know, having a basic library, uh, you know, I'm going to have some links down in the description below. Some of the stuff we've got. There's some Boy Scout stuff uh, that I picked up at thrift stores and things. Uh, a book about uh, sea kayaking, rock climbing, uh, beekeeping. Uh, the one about boating and sailing. And then all the way over here, we've got some giant books. And again, if you've been watching the Alien Invasion series, you may have seen these featured. Uh, these are huge compendiums of information on all sorts of, uh, well, this one is about uh, wilderness survival. There's another one on homesteading and uh, um, you know, living off the land, you know, farming, that kind of thing. Overall, 
There is so much information in these books. I've been doing this stuff for 10 plus years, probably about, you know, like 20 years or so. I know I've got a lot in my head. You know, people will come to my channel and they say, oh, thank you so much for sharing this stuff. You know, I, I, you know, I wish I knew as much as you did. I, I try not to let that inflate my ego. But, and what helps with that is my knowledge that as much as I've picked up over the years, as much as I know, the, the amount that I don't know absolutely dwarfs that. There is so much more that I don't know than I do know. And having a library like this is a great way of just expanding your mind out into uh, reaches that you don't have any experience with. And you can do it even if the grid goes down and the internet goes down. If you have a paper library in your home, it's a great asset for you if that kind of S ever H the T and you know you were in a situation where you needed to know things and you otherwise wouldn't have access to that information. So I hope that this video uh, has been helpful to you and the most important thing I want to say at the end is if you do get books, if you do create a library, consider actually reading it because that's an important step as well. That's it. Thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.